Hi! Currently the furthest man-made objects from Earth are the Voyager space probes launched in 1977. Voyager 2 is currently 17 billion kilometres from Earth. That's like going to Pluto and back and then back to Pluto again, roughly. And we can still contact it. How? Let's find out. So what does it take to track Voyager 2? A big antenna. So in the case of this 70 meter Deep Space Station 43, so we can track on smaller antennas. We have a couple of beam wave guys that are 34 meter, but if you want a nice signal with a lot of margin, you pick a big antenna. So looking at it, you've got 8,000 tons, 4,000 below the bearing, essentially 4,000 tons at swivel. The height is all hydraulic. 43 is a hydraulic antenna. So, and it uses a unique platform called a hydrostatic bearing. So there's no friction. So it, the whole antenna that moves rides on a film of oil 7,000th of an inch thick. Pressurized to 2,500 PSI. It just lifts it a tiny amount and it slews round. At the moment we are looking at Voyager 2 we're tracking now. The beam width of the antenna on X-ray band, 30 milli degrees. So, so if we deviate any further, side to side we lose it. So in fact, it's not just the antenna pointing that's the important thing, it's the subreflector as well. Uh, the subreflector sort of moves on all axis and we actually have calibration tables that, so as the antenna goes down, we have a squint factor where essentially the antenna will sag and it has to be compensated for as well. Now that's just the antenna side, so we have obviously that has to be extremely accurate. Then we also have the RF side and that's where the interesting stuff comes in. The antenna is pointing up, surface of the dish, classic parabolic, classic Cassegrain, where it bounces off the dish surface, hits the subreflector and then is reflected down into the cones. Now, low noise amplification is important, so and we certainly don't want to introduce any more noise than sort of the, the sky is giving us. So we, we cool it, and uh, all our LNAs are cryogenically cooled, about oh a tropical four and a half Kelvin. So you get rid of the the noise effect there. In fact, the whole system noise temperature uh, of one of our antennas, so if you look from the cone to the, uh, the receiver itself, is probably no more than 19 Kelvin. So when you're looking for very small signals in essentially a field of noise, so if, yeah, you don't want to be introducing any, any further noise. If you look at uh, what we are receiving, so strange enough, Voyager isn't the weakest signals you expect it to be because it's so far and, and it's, it's our weakest signal, but it doesn't really work like that. Uh, Voyager is weak. Uh, we uh, so probably have around about negative 158 dBm, uh, but we do have lower. Uh, Voyager has a nice big high gain antenna. Uh, so we all have a number of missions and I'll, I'll give you an example. So we have Kepler, which is literally just outside of our atmosphere and it's looking for exoplanets. While it's looking for exoplanets, so it's configured to talk to Earth on its low gain antenna. And we can be receiving in the mid neg 160s, so it's even lower again. MAVEN, we have around Mars, again, so not very far away at all, relatively speaking. Uh, so, and, you know, we can be picking up a neg 170 dBm on MAVEN, and that's because its high gain antenna is orientated towards, a, towards Mars it's actually sort of transmitting its housekeeping, which is essentially all it is, it's 20 bits per second. It's, it's a tiny bit rate. Uh, so just to allow us to know that everything's cool, everything's operating fine, and the spacecraft health is, is good. Negative 158 about we receive. So what does that give us as far as telemetry? Telemetry on Voyager is a huge 160 bits. So it's been that for quite a while, and. We're hoping we won't have to go any lower. Uh, we have the margin on the 70 meter. So 
Voyager, we actually receive 160 bits. Uh, the symbol to noise ratio on, on this antenna here is around about six and a half, seven dB. That's, uh, that's the symbol noise ratio. So the bit rate is 160 bits, as I said, but we actually use a, an encoding method called the multi-convolutional encoder. Same thing you have in your ADSL modems. And what that does is affect, it's a, it's a form of forward error correction. Uh, so you transmit 320 symbols to get your 160 bits of data, but it gives you a 3 dB improvement. It doubles the symbol SNR. We now have a bit SNR of double that, or should I say 3 dB, not double as in numbers. You look at a 34 meter, so obviously it takes about three and a bit 34 meters to, to be the equivalent 70 meter. We're hovering around zero on the symbol to noise ratio. So you can tell if we have a, a, a little bit of rain on a 34 meter, it wipes Voyager out. When we go below probably 30 degrees and you start getting the, the ground noise coming up, it wipes out Voyager. So what, if we don't have a 70 meter available during that period, what we'll do, we'll array two 34 meters. So not the equivalent of a 70 meter, but it gets us past that hard, so I suppose, a little bit more of a margin so we can sort of ride that weather out and we can get a little bit lower on the horizon. As far as transmit, Voyager has essentially different requirements for its transmit. Uh, we have a BLF where we transmit a series of ramps and this is to try and characterize uh, a failed capacitor that happened eons ago and we've, we've, we've handled that all the way up to today. This is their second receiver, so the first one is dead. So, and if you think of Voyager 2, it's, it's a very, 1977, and you think of the technology around at the time. Uh, and yeah, so, and it was just a failed, a failed component. So unfortunately, the, the backup had already died. So whoever designed it came up with this clever idea of, if I don't talk to it, within a certain time, then obviously the spacecraft thinks there's something wrong. And then it goes into a safing mode where it grabs its star scanner and starts scanning around, making sure it's orientated towards Earth. So another method had to be thought of to actually get into the receiver that was failing. So that's where we had to categorize the best lock frequency or the rest frequency of uh, the receiver. And we'll do almost on a weekly basis a best lock frequency characterization where we just transmit a ramp and then 30 hours later, we see uh, the receiver status. So we'll get a lock status and we'll have a speed. And we'll know then that when we have to transmit later on commands to it, we know ex exactly the, the frequency that we need to transmit on. You know, so if you, you look at radios and, and then you look at the DSN. And if we're more than a couple of hertz out, over 15 billion kilometers, we're doing something wrong. So it's, it's that, you know, uh, to put it into perspective, so sort of our subcarrier loop bandwidth is half a hurt. Half a hurt. So, <laughs> so, so they're all really tight tolerances, so, and, and all the spacecraft that we do support, including Voyager, are, are, are certainly well characterized as well. Uh, and also we have a wonderful system, Voyager doesn't use it, where uh, the spacecraft will turn a, a signal around at a fixed ratio as well. So we actually have a predicted frequency that arrives back on Earth because it's referenced to our frequency of within 0 0.02 of a hertz. Again, so these things can travel billions of kilometers as well. Very uh, so we, we uplink, so we have an 18 kilowatts and that allows us to send a no-op command. So every now and again, we'll send a series of commands which are essentially just commands saying, you're happy, just reset that timer and we'll talk to you another time. Uh, and we compensate from the failed capacitor by just retransmitting that same command. As we start ramping those frequencies, we'll just keep on transmitting it. If one gets in, that's all we need. With uplinking commands, as far as a sequence, where we're actually telling it to do a mag roll or some other form of calibration, we can't, we can't rely on luck. So what we'll do then is We'll characterize the best lock frequency, but we'll transmit 75 kilowatts. We'll get that margin into the spacecraft so that receiver can hang on just that little bit further. 
And so, so far, so it seems to be a successful method, and it has been for the last 20 years. If you look at weather, the impact of weather, which is really the, uh, a good way of characterizing where we drop it off, uh, and you talk about system noise temperature. So normally I say we're about 19 degrees. If we get a rain shower, that signal, uh, sorry, the, the SNT, the system noise temperature, can raise to around about 90 Kelvin and, and above. And we all see that 7 dB SNR just disappear to zero. So rain is, is a big factor here. I should point out with Voyager as well, it has two frequencies. So uh, we receive on X, but we transmit S. So completely different systems. In fact, of one thing you can't see is we have two separate cones. And so, and you'll see, we have an S-band cone and an X-band. And you go, well, hang on. So how do we focus on both cones yep. at the same time? Well, we use a dichroic mirror. Ooh, so a dichroic mirror. Think of a, a band pass filter. So it's a piece of a hardware. So what we have is we have the S and X signals coming down and a dichroic plate and get you on there, a dichroic plate, which is, has perforations, which have been drilled to allow X-band through at that wavelength, but reflect the big chunky Sierra bands, which are reflected to a little umbrella mirror and then down into the, the cone. So it follows the same path all the way to the dichroic, and from there, they're actually separated out. Think of not so much signal level, but think of Kelvin. It probably adds two or three Kelvin so it does introduce a little bit of noise and it does attenuate ever so slightly, but it's marginal. Uh, when we start looking at some of the, even Mars Reconnaissance Orbiter and uh, sort of Mars Odyssey, and they're pumping down three megabits. They're using either a Turbo 1.6 or an MCD 1.6. So essentially out of six bits, only one's good, but we can get down to a minus six symbol SNR. So you're, you're looking so sort of proportionally more noise than signal. So, and you go, okay, well, how do you pick the signal out of that? And fortunately, noise is random. It is. Where hopefully the signal isn't. So, so we're, we're able to, from that minus six symbol SNR, we can actually get a positive five or six bit SNR. So using that encoding method. So a lot of projects, what they'll do is they'll sacrifice symbol SNR. So for essentially, so sort of knowing that they'll get the better so of uh, bit SNR at the end of it after the user coding. Sierra band on 43 is 400 kilowatts. Uh, we've used it probably twice since I started here 30 years ago. Uh, S band is a funny frequency now. So of, uh, we've, the, the deep space network has, has tried to move out of the Sierra band and now Sierra band is uh, to the moon. But after that, we, we like X and now K, KA. So KA is coming in into it as well, about 32 gigs. Uh, so if, as far as weather is concerned, the KA is a real pain. S-band's really robust. I mean, you, and I suppose you look at the, the size of a raindrop and the, you know, the size of a, an X-band bandwidth, where it's about so big. So yeah, there's, there's obviously a fair amount of attenuation in that raindrop. You're talking about S-band, <laughs> right. so it's, it's uh, far more robust. So. Right, so it's the physical size of the water drop that does the damage. Exactly right. So right. We also have uh, the physical issues of uh, water on, we actually use a, a Capcom window, mm -hmm. uh, so which is uh, so essentially a, a film, a plastic film that goes over the cones, uh, nitrogen pumped to keep, it moist, to keep the moisture out. It blows them out uh, and RF, that's transparent. So if we get water beading on that, we actually have attenuation as well. So, so we, we've got a, a retrofitted vacuum cleaner set to reverse. So that, that's continuously blowing that, blowing that water off and, or stopping it from settling as well. We try to use uh, essentially commercial power as much as possible. Mm -hmm. Obviously it's cheaper. Uh, we have recently gone to a three megawatt uh, so up system which can take us to three minutes. So it can del deliver three megawatts for three minutes. But in, in that three minutes, hopefully our yeah. diesels have started kicking in. Right. So we have uh, four, three quarter of a megawatt so of caterpillars in there and one station and four in another. So we can provide oodles of power. 
but, but yeah, we tried to use commercial uh, and on that three minute ups, and, uh, but we always had the backup with the diesel. In fact, so when we go to level ones, and for us a level one is anything that involves uh, encounters, uh, landings, so for instance when MSL hit Mars, well, gently, and not like Beagle, no. that hit Mars. So, <laughs> so uh, then, then the site would have been on, on, on diesel power. Mm -hmm. of, and so, so regardless of what the commercial power does, uh, we've got a guaranteed power supply. If you look at the DSN, you know, we're here to essentially to, to establish that connection between the, the project and, and their spacecraft. Uh, Voyager was launched in 1977. Uh, the Deep Space Network has supported it so from launch. So you know, I'm, I, I still have colleagues who, who can remember that launch now. So I, I'm a relative newcomer at 30 years. So <laughs> we actually have a, a a guy who's 15 years, and he's said to be here dog watch. So and he 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 was the last recruit. So so. Uh, Voyage is a special spacecraft uh, for the entire DSN. Uh, the fact that Canberra has the only visibility makes it even more special. Uh, we do have sight of Voyager 1, and every time we go down on Voyager 1, it's like it feels like we're poaching. Right. So, because nobody can see our, uh, our Voyager 2. So Vo Voyager 2 is definitely a Southern Hemisphere spacecraft that uh, really sort of belongs to Canberra. Uh, so we have a vested interest to make sure that it lasts. And whereas Voyager 1 has, has exited into interstellar space, Voyager 2 has, isn't there yet. So th we're still waiting for that milestone as well. So, so there's, with Voyager 2, there's still that element of anticipation. So, and you, know, you, you think of a spacecraft just going out and out and out, doing nothing. It's not. It's still an active spacecraft. You know, so on a regular basis, it's doing calibrations that we're monitoring on Earth. So, you know, when it, it calibrates its uh, magnetometer in what they refer to as a mag roll, where they spin the gyros up a couple of days before and they rotate the entire magnet uh, spheric antenna around, and then they'll do it again. And we actually see that variation on the downlink as well. So, and here we are 15 billion kilometers away and you really do feel a part of it. So even though you're separated by an awful lot of space. Uh, what we have for the future, Voyager was launched with an RTG and as far as a power source, uh, which means it has little pellets of plut plutonium that uh, have a half-life of a fair way, I think 70 odd years, I think, for, for plutonium. Uh, unfortunately, the RTG themselves are starting to break down, so it's not the plutonium that's the issue, it's right. essentially the, uh, the transducers. Uh, so we can't see us tracking Voyager beyond, say, 2025, mm -hmm. which is still a fair number of years. And Very well, impressive. And we're still hoping that it will hit interstellar space sometime within that. I'd, I'd hate it to lose it. And, and then so suddenly it found it. And 160 bits, we can still go further down. Right. We can still go down to 40 bits. 40 bits per second. <laughs> 40 bits per second. So in fact, it does that now. So when it does uh, sort of changes on board so if, uh, and it does equipment swaps, it will go down to an en engineering 40 bits. And we're talking about the paint drying. Uh, so 160 bits takes probably about three or four minutes to lock. So 40, 40 bits, you know, you're, you're pushing it out a little bit further. As you're talking about Maven, the 20 bits, it could be anything up to 14 minutes to lock. So it's, after 13 minutes, you find there's some, some issue with configuration. It's a, it's a long wait to get to that second frame. So, so that can be an issue as well. So, so now Voyager uh, is, is quite special for the Deep Space Network. And so, you know, other, other spacecraft will come and go, but that's the one that's going to endure. Did they design it to last that long? Did they think it would? I suppose uh, by its nature, uh, the fact that it had the RTG meant it could. Uh, I honestly don't believe they thought it would. You know, you look at the primary missions that they had, you know, Saturn and Jupiter. After that, it was, all, it was like, woohoo. Yeah, bonus. So it was, and the fact that they actually got one shooting out to the south and one shooting out to the north of the ecliptic so sort of gave a little bit of diversity as well. And so, you know, not so much for Voyager 1, but Voyager 2 had the, the secondary encounters and, and they just kept on going. Sad thing, we went in the wrong, right part of the space to do Pluto. Right. But, so, you know, so, uh, the Uranus and Neptune sort of encounters were quite special as well. Mm -hmm.